Well, thank you, choir. I hope you'll allow me just a point of personal privilege to say how much I appreciate the fact that we come here at this early service on Sunday morning and see such a wonderful group of people in the choir. I know of very few churches who have multiple services who even have a choir on Sunday morning. None of them have a choir like this at the early service on Sunday morning, and I thank the Lord for them. And the amazing thing is, at the 11 o'clock service, the choir loft will be completely filled with different people. Our choir members are members of our Sunday school. They're involved in other things happening in our church. Many of them are Sunday school teachers. And I just wanted to say how much I appreciate them. And I really do love the praise choruses that we sing. I, I find myself being helped in private worship with songs like, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. And I am so thankful that Christianity is a singing religion. And I'm grateful for the music that we have. We've been going through the book of John since Christmas. And we've gotten, of course, through the resurrection. And today I'd like for us to look at a post-resurrection occurrence in the book of John, in John 21. We're going to look at all of the chapter. We'll read beginning in verse 25. In John 20, is, John is convinced of the Lord that, and inspired of the Lord to let us know exactly why he writes the letters he writes. In John 20, in verse 30 and 31, he wrote, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then in the very last verse of the, first, of the 21st, the last chapter, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. And I found myself in trying to decide how to preach the book of John to you, having to make decisions about what would not be taught and what would and what would be said and what not. And I sort of feel like if all the sermons that could come out of the book of John were written down, the world could not hold them. But today we're going to look at our Lord drawing one of his own back from failure, just like he draws you and me back from our failures. Let's begin reading in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went out where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. To stretch out your hands meant in those days that you're going to be crucified. In verse 19, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Anybody here ever failed? I guess a better question is, is there anybody here who hasn't failed at one time or another? Simon Peter was a man whose life had been changed with a great call and vision of God. He had been called of God to leave the catching of fish to the broader and wider thrill and joy of making a difference in the world by simply casting his net into humanity's waters and drawing to safety precious people and souls. And his life had been consumed by following the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he burned with the joy of what God had called him to do. One day came, I guess, his finest day. One day Jesus asked a question which only Peter had the answer for. I think he must have tingled with the knowledge of the presence of God's Holy Spirit. He must have burned with the indication that his life and even his tongue was in control of the Spirit of God. And he became the first one to make that majestic statement, you are the Christ, the Son, 
of the living God. But also in that mind were other majestic thoughts. Majestic thoughts born of human ambition, tinted by human sin, caused by human kinds of thoughts about only this world. In his mind also were dizzying ideas of what it meant for Christ to be the Messiah and for those who would be linked with him. Ideas of thrones and powers and authority and reward. And Jesus rebuked him for those kinds of thoughts. And he said to him, get behind me, Satan. He said, Peter, you're, you're talking just like the devil. These thoughts have not been born of God like your first one, but these thoughts are born of the spirit of Satan in this world. And then his spiritual growth was arrested. For every time we find that God does not agree with us, it has us to check again who sits on the throne of our lives. His spiritual growth was arrested. And on that crucial night when the tension was so sharp you could cut it with a knife, on that Thursday night that Christ would later be arrested and it would lead to his crucifixion the next day, our Lord did an unkingly thing in Peter's mind, an, an unmessiah like thing, when they had come together to, to observe that Last Supper, instead of acting like the Messiah, as he thought, instead of acting kingly and lordly and sovereignly, he acted like a servant. Our Lord even performed what only slaves did. He divested himself of an outer robe. He wrapped a towel around his waist like a slave. He took a basin of water and he washed and towel dry the apostles' feet. And this staggered Peter. This was not what he thought the Messiah should do. And then Jesus said, Tonight, every one of you is going to run and hide like scattered sheep. And Peter said, Not me, Lord. Not me. All these other guys may run and hide, but not me. You'll find me to be true even if it's prison or death. I'm going to follow you all the way. And Jesus said, you know, before the rooster announces sunrise in the morning, you will have disowned me three times. Peter still said, not, not so. When they got to the Garden of Gethsemane, our Lord took Peter and James and John a little farther with him and said, fellas, I, I need you tonight. I'm counting on you. I want you to watch with me. He's saying, I want you to pray with me. And then our Lord did what he normally did. His prayer time was usually a private time with he and his father. And he went a little bit farther and prayed not to find the will of God, but for the strength to do it. He came back twice during that time. He found his disciples sleeping. You see, when you're proud in your faith, like Simon Peter, when you're somewhat arrogant, because after all, you're the first one to say, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the thing that goes first is prayer. I mean, why does a spiritual giant need to pray? In a little while, there was light coming down the road and entering the gate of Gethsemane, light held from torches and angry sounds, and suddenly the serenity of Gethsemane was interrupted by Roman soldiers and Judas and evening bystanders who had seen the soldiers marching along seriously and understood something was going to happen. So like a modern-day ambulance chaser, they came along to see what was happening. And Simon Peter had not felt like praying, but he was ready to fight. He drew his sword. Maybe he wasn't quite ready to fight a Roman soldier, <laughs> but he confronted a poor guy named Malchus who suddenly found himself confronted by the most wild-eyed, worst swordsman in all of southern Palestine. In Jesus' view of things, uh, Christian ministers don't need to learn how to fight. So he hadn't had any training like that in his time with Jesus. And Malchus found himself soon 
facing the swinging sword of this wild-eyed man, he lost his right ear, which means that Simon Peter was probably left-handed, which blows completely my theory that everybody's left-handed until they sin once. Jesus came, once again rebuked him. He said, Simon, put away your sword. He was saying, if I needed someone to fight for me, I've got better folks than you. I have 12 legions of angels that could wipe out this place in a minute. Put away your sword. They took Jesus away. They cuffed him. They read him his rights, took him away. Peter didn't know what to do. He just didn't know what to do. I wouldn't have either, would you? Everything he did, he thought he was doing right, but he, he was rebuked. And he didn't know what to do, so he followed from a long way off, a long, safe, distance way off. And then when they got to the high priest's house where much of the night was spent in deciding how to get Jesus crucified by the religious mafia of the day, John knew, the scripture tells us, the, the gatekeeper in the, to get into the court of the inner circle there in the courtyard. When Peter came there, the little girl who was watching the gate said, you're not one of his disciples, are you? He said, no, I'm not. After a while, someone else said to him, you're not one of his disciples, are you? And once again, he said, no, I'm not. Someone had built a charcoal fire. They were warming themselves in the very early morning hours. And somebody said to him, didn't I see you with Jesus back in the garden? I think by now Peter was thinking about what's the penalty for assault with a weapon? What's Jesus gotten into? This looks like a very, very serious thing. And he began to curse. He began to use words he thought he had forgotten. He began to curse and say, I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have anything to do with him. And in the silence that followed that, a sound seldom heard in that city was the crowing of a rooster. And others heard the proud crowing of a rooster who thought he was giving the sun permission to rise. But Simon Peter heard the words, failure, failure. And he went out into the dark, cold night and wept and wept. I was in Jerusalem one time on the valley on the other side of the city. And early on a morning, I heard a rooster crow, and it reminded me of all the times I have failed our Lord. And I was thankful that I knew the rest of the story. The third appearance of Jesus after his resurrection was this appearance. Simon Peter had still carried his times of failure. Jesus had visited with him, but he still carried his idea of unforgivable failure. You know, failure doesn't take away your gifts. Simon was still, he was still the leader. And he said, fellas, I'm going to go do something I know how to do. I'm going to go fish. And whether this was the beginning again of the fishing business or whatever was intended, Simon Peter took seven of the 12 people Jesus had in, intended to start his mission in the world with. Seven of the 12 apostles were on that boat. And while failure does not diminish your gifts so much, it does diminish your vision and your goal. Peter said, I guess I'll never be able again now to have the dream of reaching people. So now I guess I'll go back and do the thing I can do. I'll go back catching fish. And he took those men with him, and they fished, and they fished, and once again, there was failure. All night, they'd caught nothing. And about the same time the rooster had crowed, a week or so before, about that time in the morning, 
a voice call through the light fog out into the sea? Fellows, have you caught anything? That's a terrible question when you haven't caught anything. Reminding once again of failure. And the one who called them had not failed. They could see through the fog that he had a charcoal fire burning, and they, they could smell the, the smell of, of cooking fish. He'd caught some. And he said, put the net on the other side of the boat. And I imagine those professional fishermen thought, what in the world is this guy talking about? But they probably shrugged their shoulders and said, why not? And so they dropped the fish on the other side of the boat, and the net was so full of fish that they couldn't get it in the boat. They had to drag it beside the boat to shore. It was then John began to realize something unusual was happening. It's amazing how some people are a little bit more able to see the Lord at work than others. And John said, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. And they, while the others brought the boat, John and Peter rushed to be with him there. And he had that charcoal fire going. Two times in the Word of God do we read of a charcoal fire. The one Simon Peter stood by when he denied the Lord for the third time. And this one that he stood by when the Lord God brought him all the way back from his failure after they had had their breakfast, the Lord said, Simon, son of John, all oh, that must have hurt. The name Jesus had given him, he said, your name is Simon Barjona, son of John, but you will be called Petra, rock, Cephas in Aramaic, rock. His name was going to be rock, but he was not a rock at this time. He had, he had failed in that thing. And so the Lord said, Simon, son of John, how that must have hurt him. Do you truly love me more than these? Remember how Simon had said, Lord, these other turkeys may fail you, but I won't. Man, you'll always find me by your side. You'll always find me doing the thing that you want me to do. These other turkeys may fail you, but I won't. He said, Simon, do you really love me more than these? And the humble Simon Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. No bragging now. No boastfulness about how my love is better than everybody else's love and how deeper my devotion is than theirs. He had exposed himself to himself. And he said, Lord, you know that I love you. The Lord said, then feed my lambs. The second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Then tend to my sheep. The third time, the third time, remember Simon Peter denied him three times. The third time. You know, it takes about as long to get out of a sin as it does to get in it. I think that's what God is saying. The third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. I'm not hiding anything from you, and you know that. You know everything. You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Then the word goes on to say an interesting thing after that. Christ read that verse 18 that talks about how, he would, how Peter would die. He said, Peter, you said you would die for me. You're really going to. And when he said you're going to stretch your hands out, that means somebody's going to crucify you just like they did me. And then John makes an editorial comment in verse 19. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And he said to him, follow me. In this, in this episode, we find how to return from failure. And the interesting thing that dawned upon me as I looked at this this week, you heard about the guy who wondered where the sun went at night, and he stayed up all night worrying about that, and it finally dawned on him. Well, something dawned on me this week. 
And that is that as I struggle for months to find a mission statement for a church that's biblically based and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I found that statement again in this short enterprise with, with Peter. The way God pulls people back to him and to him is found in these simple things. Do you love me? Three times he said, do you love me? You remember that the first commandment is you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And here when Simon Peter needed to be brought back, the Lord Christ didn't say, Peter, what's wrong with you? Oh, don't ever say anything to people you love, what's wrong with you? You blew it, man. I was counting on you. I was counting on you to help and to stand up and be great, and, and you blew the whole thing. Peter, what's wrong with you? He didn't say that. He simply asked, do you love me? Do you love me? What does that mean? Does it mean, do you believe in me? No. Does it mean, do you have warm feelings toward me? No. It means, are you willing to obey me and follow me? Thirty-eight times in the book of John, this word for love, this agape love, is mentioned. Thirty-one of those 38 times take place from that night in John 13 at the upper room until just the end of John's chapter, just a few, few days in the life of Christ. Thirty-one of those times speak of loving God or loving our Lord Christ. Every one of them is connected to obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. You are my friends if you do what I tell you. Over and over in the gospel we find love and obedience put together. Love is something you do. Love is obeying the Lord Christ. Do you love me? Will you obey me? We will love God. We will learn and obey the Word of God. That's another way of saying we will love God. And then he said, if you love me, then that love has to include the people I love. You feed my sheep, tend to my lambs, feed my sheep. Three times he said, it has to do with loving and serving the people. We will love each other. We will love each other ought to be the bedrock of any group of people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. And then he said, Peter, not only will you love me and serve people, but you will die well. It's interesting, isn't it? You will die well. When he told Peter that he would have that kind of death, John's editorial is that he said this to signify what manner of death by which Simon Peter would glorify the Lord. Is there any desire in you that your manner of death would glorify God? Of course, that means the manner of life, too, because that's all we remember in death is how people lived. But it's interesting, the strong language found in this scripture. Look at the word signify. By this he signified what manner of death that Peter would die. The word is sign. It usually means miracles. Eighteen times when the Bible speaks about a miracle that Jesus did in the Gospel of John, it says it, it, was a, it, it signified, it was a sign. It indicated it was a sign. Two times it's used other than that. One is when the Bible says John the Baptist did no miracles. It said he did no miraculous signs. He did no indications that, that he had this kind of power. And the other is talking about the way Simon Peter would live and die would be a sign to the glory of God. It is possible for people who love God to live in such a way that their lives will have as much impact on the world around them as the miracles of Jesus Christ. That their lives and even their death can point to God in the same way that Jesus' miracles pointed to God. And he said that's what Simon Peter's life and death would do. He said that they would glorify God. Twenty-three times in the Gospel of John, 
is used the term to glorify God each time it spoke of Jesus. This is the only time it didn't speak of Jesus Christ, that Peter, by his life and death, would bring glory to God. This is the guy who failed. This is the guy who came all the way back from failure. And this is the one who shows us that we can come back from our failure if we will love God if we, in loving him, will obey him. If in loving and obeying him, we will serve his sheep and serve the people he loves. If in learning and loving and serving, we will be the kind of people who want our lives and even our death to bring glory to God, we can still make the difference, the vast difference, and reap the great reward. I heard a man tell this week about seeing a tombstone that indicated that people's death was not bringing glory to God. He said there was a man and a woman who, were, who were, had their tombstones placed. They hadn't died yet, <laughs> but they had their tombstones placed in a very prominent place in an Oklahoma cemetery with large and beautiful stones that even had their pictures on them. And at the top of each tombstone in a very prominent place was put the word atheist. And on her tombstone, she put the quote, I loved animals and I was kind to many animals. Under his, on his tombstone, it was quoted, I'm a busy man and I don't have time for this. It's a wonderful way to die and glorify God, isn't it? Contrast that with Dr. Bill Wallace, the medical doctor who served as your missionary and mine in China. And when the communists came, he stayed because he felt it was the will of God. And soon they captured him because they couldn't tell lies about Americans when there was one living like that among them. And they captured him and tortured him until he died. The Chinese took his body and lovingly buried it. And on the tombstone is still engraved the words you can see today in China, to me, to live is Christ. That death brought glory to God. You remember the tombstone in Scotland, I think it is, that here lies the bones of Martin Johnston, who in this village cobbled shoes to the glory of God for 40 years. No matter how you meet expenses, your life can be lived to the glory of God. And that's his word to us today. We will love God. We will love each other. We will learn and obey the word of God. We will commit our lives, our talents, our resources to the task of telling as many as we can about the love of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, Father, I pray you'll help us to come to you with our failure and know that your words are not scolding. They're not, you fail me, you let me down. What's wrong with you? But your word is simply... Do you love me now? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Glorify God with your life and even your death. I pray, Lord, that by your grace and your strength and your power, we shall be that kind of people. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to invite you now to come and make the commitment that honors our Lord. Would you come and profess your faith in Christ or tell us that you've done that or share with us that? Schedule your baptism. Christian, would you come and join our church? I know I was looking at the pews and before the service this morning and seeing how close they are to each other, and maybe you feel, well, I can't push my way past these people and be rude and come. It's too crowded. Uh, I, I guarantee you the people around you will be thrilled that you'll be coming, and they'll make way for you because they've done the same things themselves, and they're glad they did. So whatever our Lord would have you do, meet us at the front here and let's indicate that by your making this decision for him today. Let's stand quietly and reverently and you come just now.